Okay, we're going to get started now. We're going to start with the thir the era three, which is. Oh my God. <laughs> Erethi. We're going to be talking about Vancouverism and the regional strategic plan. Leading this era will be Eric Vance, who's a CIP fellow, uh, planning consultant, and former city of Port Moody director of planning. Please give him a hand. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be brief here. Uh, I don't have the uh, slides that uh, Michael Geller had for his presentation. Uh, if I did, uh, you, Michael, I had longer hair than you did, man, back in the 70s. So uh, I don't have the photograph here to prove it, but I did. Uh, anyways, an exciting lineup of, uh, of guest speakers for the third area here, and I want to get into it and let them get up here. Uh, I'm going to start off with Gordon Price, who I think most of you certainly in this room know, uh, the fellow with the SFU Center for Dialogue. Uh, former director of the SFU uh, City Program for many years, and I know a number of you here uh, participate in that program in a variety of ways. And just as importantly, uh, Vancouver City Councilor from 1986 to 2002. And so uh, Gordon's going to be talking about the post expo euphoria. This is, uh, don't you push that button to advance? I don't need it. Okay. Post-Expo Euphoria. It's true there were a lot of drugs being done. <laughs> but you have to know that in the half decade before Expo, it was mean and nasty. America had been going through one of its nervous breakdowns. Reagan was elected. Volcker pushed interest rates into the 20s. The economy seemed to collapse here. Bill Bennett came in. Austerity budget. It was really unpleasant. And the other thing you have to know is it didn't change City Hall. The continuity that Anne is so right about that started with the team council in 72 carried right on through to 2010. Six mayors and 14 councils. Right, Anne? The narrative would have you believe that there was great division. Cope and NPA and East and West. And yeah, in that center, the pendulum does swing a little. But in the values that came out of that era, particularly because of this coterie of planners that you've heard about, whether in Victoria or Vancouver or the region, and thank you, St. Jane, and all the other writers who influenced that generation, and of course, the leadership of Grace Faxman. What changed after Expo was the playground got bigger, way bigger, and the money that was available to play was like nothing we'd seen before. Whether it came out of basically the extractions for the Concord site or CACs or whatever it was, taking value from this increase is what allowed the planners and the engineers to follow through on so many of those principles and ideas. Nobody fundamentally changed the chessboard, even if the pieces moved. But something else was going on at the same time that is almost never talked about. Because it's a difficult subject in some ways, but it's critical to understand. In the southeast quadrant of the city, and through most of the east side, the Trudeau families and babies were beginning to rise into the middle class. With the changes in the Immigration Acts of 67 and 72, guess what happened? You don't have to guess. You are it. So, when I walked into a high school, when I first got elected, and I was basically the only white guy, it was pretty obvious what was going to happen. The city was going to change, and it did. 52% of the people of the city, all of them, people of color. Just let that register, because it was occurring at this same period. And with the other side of that economic equation, Lee Ka-shing and the purchase of the Expo site, and the role that people like Stanley Kwok 
and a generation of people like Milt Wong and others, the transition occurred not only seamlessly, but almost like a golden age for this city. So much of what we had aspired to, we realized. The ideas that came out of the south shore of Falls Creek were applied on a different scale to the north shore. But the 2.75 parks were there, the child care centers were there, the infrastructure was there. We extracted it all out of it and people like Stanley and Concord realized that this is where the economic benefit actually was. Seven mega projects were occurring simultaneously. Coal Harbor and Bayshore and Concord and International Village and, well, yes, you can include, I can't remember them all, false, uh, Fraser Lands and Arbutus and, ah, so many. Thousands and thousands of units would pour on, which meant that strategically, and this was the strategy, we could concentrate on the density on the brownfield sites and leave the established neighborhoods from the west end to Strathcona, from Dunbar to Kensington. Basically leave them alone and concentrate on the evolution of them through the work that was being done through city plan. The balance was pretty much in place and it worked great. And no one expected the scale of money and change that would occur. We just never anticipated that kind of scale. But don't let that distract us from the achievement of this generation of planners. Yes, and engineers could talk for another five minutes on what they did in terms of achieving our engineering and transportation visions. It worked, and we can say that without qualification to some degree. Yeah, we always have to put the qualification on it. But it's more important than ever in these extremely disruptive and uncertain times, America's going through yet another nervous breakdown, that we acknowledge what has worked and that it has been passed on to this next generation. Us, the old guys, the next wave out there. Hi, Michael. And then you. It's yours. It's a legacy. We're proud of it, putting all the emphasis now on you to carry it on. Have complete confidence that you will. I want to thank PIBC for the chance to do this. It's just a wonderful opportunity. Congratulations to you all. Well, thank you very much, Gordon. Here we are. Now, our next speaker, Clive Rock, uh, former Director of Strategic Planning and Policy with TransLink and Administrator of Transportation Planning with Metro Vancouver. And having had a conversation on the phone with uh, Clive last week, I don't think he's going to be very shy in offering his opinions. So, welcome, Clive. There we go. Good. So, back in 93 uh, in and 96, there were two, two plans adopted. The Transport 2021 Transportation Plan was one of the major underpinnings of the Liberal Region Strategic Plan and has been the only plan ever, even to this day, where all the cats were herded. That meaning it dealt with investments that were meant to happen on provincial facilities, municipal facilities, all of the transportation in this region. It's the only plan that's ever been produced like that. Hasn't been one, one since. And the other thing is, it focused very much on, on outcomes rather than outputs. So it wasn't that project oriented, it was what kind of thing do we want in the future? What opportunities do we want to have? Uh, what sort of mode share do we want to have in terms of people, people's ability to get around and so on? But taking stock in 96, so it was only three years after the plan was, was uh, adopted and approved, it wasn't happening. There was a lot of drift, uh, particularly on the transit side. It was underinvestment. That was because BC Transit, at the time, budgets were set by the province and they were approved year by year. There was no, no long term planning. There were issues around governance. Uh, the mayors in the region, the municipalities, wanted local control. So um, it, there was no system to roads in a collective way, and there was inconsistent funding. And it was concluded the governance and funding of all transportation in the region needed to be fixed. Now, at the time, 
This is what it looked like in terms of agencies in the region. Oh, sorry, I put the wrong slide up. That's what it actually looked like. It, <coughs> in terms of the, the agencies involved in, in transportation in the region. I apologize for that. Um, it was pretty dysfunctional. So, starting the process, Ken Cameron and I used to carpool. He was my boss at, at, at GVRD. And we decided one day, well, why don't we just try and go big or go home? So, we hatched a plan where Ken would do a presentation to the GVRD Strategic Planning Committee. God may have been there. And we played pretend. We pretended it was, it was not 1996. We pretended it was 2000. And we were looking back at the successful negotiation and the creation of what we then called a transportation district. And surprisingly, this engaged the committee, it engaged the board, and, and got, got, the ball, got the ball rolling. We, we were worried we were going to be sobered by disaster, but that, that didn't happen at that time. We got phenomenal report, uh, support from folks like Gordon, Murray Din Woody there from Regional Engineers Advisory Committee, Dave McClellan, some of the municipal planners. Uh, but George Puel and Beth Johnson were absolutely, absolutely pivotal. There was extensive consultation, um, many meetings in municipalities, and it used to take about two months to do one lap of all the municipalities. Uh, to council meetings. And there was a lot of sort of ritual flogging of the bureaucrats and, and, and so on. <laughs> what the GVRD wanted was, is outlined there, but the main thing was to get stable, predictable and appropriate funding, meaning funding to come from transportation sources so it sends signals to the marketplace to try and achieve the outcomes you want to have local control of transit to deal with roads and TDM and so on. And there's some of the timing, the province agreed to negotiate. I think they got sick of deciding where bus stops go on Canada Way and maybe it was, it was time for someone else to take it over. And in April 1999, uh, TransLink took over. What, what went unreported, and we have a director of TransLink here, Murray Dan Woody, it was actually its 20th birthday last month, the board. Because the board took over actually on, 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 in October um, 1998. Its responsibilities were unique and they remain unique in, in, in Canada. It, it has an integrated approach to transit roads, TDM, and so on. At the time, there were links to air quality programs, a wide variety of transportation sources, both existing and future. And it, it had to support, at the time, the Liverpool Region Strategic Plan in, in, in what it did. The board comprised it of, of 12 local representatives and three pale green ones there. I think of them as the sort of phantom provincial members because they rarely showed up and they decided not to show up, I think, because they felt they had a conflict of interest sometimes. And any big, big decisions had to be ratified by all of the 21 municipalities through, uh, through GVRD. So that's what it looked like at the outset. It was intended to be a fairly small agency, TransLink itself, and the delivery of programs and services through subsidiaries. That's why the bus company is called Coast Mountain Bus. It was meant, TransLink itself was meant to be not confined and focused on how itchy bus drivers' pants were and operational issues like that, more dealing with the, the big, big ticket stuff. So again, a steering, not a rowing um, organization. One of the things that a lot of folks don't know is that TransLink's in the road business. It funds 600 kilometers of most of the major arterial roads in this region, so roads like Kingsway, uh, Oak Street, Canada Way, King George Boulevard, Lougheed Highway. I think it's one of the tragedies of TransLink that it adopted its, the name of TransLink and did not remain as the Greater Vancouver Transportation Authority. Because its, its name sounds like a bus company and it does not communicate to people who it's tried to get money from that it's actually doing things for them on the roads. So it's almost its, its best kept secret that it funds all of the roads, 100% of the costs in, in this region. I think it's something that I'd suggest, Mary, that that might want to be attended to at some time. Uh, during the negotiations, <coughs> the desire was to include the provincial highways within that, so it was a bigger system. Arrangements like that happen in other cities. In Calgary, the provincial highways within the city are looked after by the city of Calgary, but the province pays them for it. 
and again, it would have made TransLink's budget look a lot more balanced. So here, this is the principles that were adopted in, in pursuing it, and, and it has been relatively successful. There's been ups and downs. People, people still debate the governance and so on. I think we've got some fragmentation of the visions and things, as we've seen this week with the, uh, the ep episodic relapses in Surrey. Um, <clears throat> But on, on the positive side, I mean, this is stuff that, again, is almost some of, some of TransLink's best kept secrets. If you look at the population there in 90, there's been a, full, a big increase in population in the region um, between 95 and 2018. The total journeys, so this means, so a journey is getting from A to B, whether you have to make transfers along the way or not. So it's just the journeys, not the total number of boardings on vehicles, on transit. That's gone up phenomenally. It's gone up 141%. And the rides per capita have gone from, from the high 50s to almost 100 rides on transit per person in this region a year, which is, which is, is quite phenomenal. And again, almost everybody uses um, a TransLink-funded road or facility to drive around. Thank you, Clive. Well, our next speaker is uh, Murray Dinwoody. As uh, Clive just mentioned, Murray's currently a director uh, with TransLink. And prior to that, he was the city manager for Surrey. And planner, prior to that, he was a general manager of planning and development for Surrey. And that was over the period of 1998 to 2014. So Murray was involved in a lot of the change you've seen out in uh, Surrey. So welcome, Murray. Thanks, Eric. Yeah. Uh, I do have slides. Yeah, that button right All there. Right. Thanks. So, um, after living the dream in Surrey, I'm now living the dream at TransLink. Um, when Ken called me, Ken Cameron called me about speaking tonight, um, he said, I said to him, what would you like me to speak about? And he said, well, talk a, a bit about your experience in Surrey between 1986 and the 2010s. And then I, then I said to him, how much time do I have? And he said, you have five minutes. And I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking, how am I going to fill five minutes? <laughs> oops, I've already done whatever. So, oops. So I'd like to share my thoughts about that period of time. I think the subtitle on it would be from, suburb, sub, from a suburban municipality to a city. I think that's how I'd characterize it. So Surrey's population in 1986 was 185,000 based on the 1986 census. And today, you know, there's um, plus or minus about 540 or 550,000 people live there. So that's an increase of roughly three times in the last 32 years that uh, Surrey's experienced. 140,000 new dwelling units and obviously a very rapid pace to development. So, I'm not sure how many people in this room have worked for Surrey at some point in time, but I suspect you've either worked for Surrey or worked in Surrey for someone who's doing something in Surrey, many of you. Um, gee, I'm getting... So prior to the mid-1990s, what, what was going on? There was a majority of residential growth accommodated in single-family homes on large lots. So at that time, um, we were growing at a rate of about 10,000 a year and most of those people were living in single family homes on large lots. The market demand was for ground entry uh, oriented housing uh, on big lots with uh, families. Um, large areas of developable land were being absorbed every year. Um, you know, you can imagine with, um, let's just say 3,000 dwelling units, mostly single family being built, you can just imagine the absorption of land at you know, roughly three to four units to the acre. Uh, local job creation was not keeping pace with residential development, so we ended up with a, being a, a bedroom city. Uh, most people commuted outside of Surrey to work, and they still do, but that's a point I'll, I'll talk about a little later. Um, so residential development was widespread across the communities. Uh, there were well-developed community plans, but they weren't really refined plans. And so whenever development applications were made and went to council, they were often contentious because the neighborhoods within which development was occurring uh, still had a, a strong ownership of their neighborhood and large, large uh, rural type lots. And so there tended to be long public hearings and uh, difficult decision-making by council. 
Um, and the idea of fitting the neighborhood together, in other words, applications were not necessarily side by side and disparate, and therefore the, the fit sometimes was awkward to describe to people that came to public hearings and even for council itself. And then, as, as we've heard earlier, the Expo line was built uh, to Surrey City Centre and um, it created a much more direct connectivity to the rest of the region. Changes in the mid to late 1990s. Now this is something that uh, I wanted to sort of thank Bob Williams actually. <laughs> Quite honestly, although we've never had much uh, direct contact, Bob, you, you had a significant um, influence in terms of the, the uh, direction that Surrey w took over the course of my, um, my tenure in Surrey from 1997 to 2014 and I want to thank you for that because I know that that would have involved a lot of difficult decision making on your part as well. Um, so livable, the Livable Region Strategic Plan was adopted in 1996 and, um, and quite frankly when I looked at the objectives in that plan, the goals in that plan, um, in my heart, I often felt, gee, it almost is the, we're almost the antithesis of what the region, livable region strategic plan would anticipate happening in this region. But never um, despise small beginnings. And so there were things that were happening that were moving the city of Surrey in a direction that was consistent with the regional plan by increments. Um, the neighborhood concept plan approach was uh, developed where neighborhoods were defined by catchment areas for elementary schools were put in place where very, very detailed plans on a lot by lot basis were prepared and dialogue, a lot of dialogue often in the order of two years of, of planning work in order to ensure that the engagement was there so that people understood what the neighborhood would look like when it was completed. And that's not only the, um, that's not only the, um, the development community, that's the people that live there. And so it created a solid platform upon which council could approve development applications without there being a threat of a, a contentious public hearing around it. And in fact, that, was, that, that happened very well. Um, changes to the, um, in the mid to late uh, 90s continued. I, I won't go through all of this. I, I've noted ICBC Properties Limited's involvement in city centre. So really building the city involved three elements, residential, changing from low density to high density, economic development, trying to improve the city's financial health by creating a stronger economy in Surrey, and then creating a city centre that provided an identity to the city. Uh, so I won't go through all of these because I see I'm running out of time, but um, I'm going to go right to the end and say that the outcomes that have occurred is there's still a high pace of, of development, although the, the current um, council that was elected recently has said that they want to slow down development and um, um, take a pause and, and look at the overall um, picture of how the city's growing. Affordability continues to be a problem, but uh, densification is helping that. We all see that. We see that across the entire region. Um, economic development has been keeping pace with growth. So in other words, the, the problem that Surrey had was a ratio of roughly 0.7 local jobs per resident worker, meaning that many people that live in Surrey have to commute outside of Surrey to work. And that creates a problem, you know, um, both from a quality of life perspective as well as in relation to using up valuable resources on, on transportation infrastructure. Um, Surrey City Centre is emerging nicely as a city centre. When I look across from the TransLink building where I'm often now at meetings, and look at Surrey City Centre, there's a physical presence there now that's very gratifying to me because it's not just a name anymore, there's actually a, a physical presence to, our, to the Surrey City Centre and it's evolving into that uh, central business, the second central business district that the region has anticipated in its, its current um, um, strategic plan. And sustainability is obviously a focus and I, and I want to mention one thing before I, um, I uh, stop um, talking here, but Patrick Condon came to me in the uh, late 1990s, early 2000 I think, and said to me, do you want to do a plan, a sustainable community plan, neighborhood concept plan, based on the principles of sustainability? And I said, tell me a bit about this Patrick. He told me an idea of what he wanted to do. And then a, a whole myriad of people from every uh, direction of, um, of servicing and planning, uh, environment, agricultural land reserve got together with, in a charrette and formed the basis for the East Clayton plan that in my mind was a very good plan. Um, balanced, um, provided a, a neighborhood where people could live, recreate, 
work and live uh, in a continuum of, uh, of life um, as a starting point for others to use as an example to make better even. And so at this point in time, the one thing that was lacking that was based, that plan was based on was uh, transit service. And, um, and it has not fully met the expectations because transit wasn't available when uh, the plan was approved and when development occurred. But now with, um, with uh, TransLink having received you know, a, a fair amount of funding from um, the federal government and the provincial government, there are um, uh, prospects across the entire region for sustainability to be a much more uh, attainable goal at the neighborhood level. So I, I want to thank you for listening to me. I wanted to say that I, I feel um, honored to be included amongst uh, such a, um, an auspicious group of speakers today. Um, and certainly um, have had a, a much more minor role in building this region than many of these speakers have. So thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And I'll turn it back to you. So uh, I've been uh, in the profession for 38 years so far. And uh, virtually all that time has been as a, a consultant, except for three years uh, from 92 to 95 when I was director of planning for the city of Port Moody, which you know anything about Port Moody, it's a little wild. And uh, anyways, I quit very suddenly in 95. I mean, literally, I decided one day I'd had enough and I quit. Uh, ironically, I've been a consultant to the city since then, but the job got advertised and I had this call uh, from this Jim McIntyre guy and I'd met him once. And uh, Jim at that point was up at the city of Cologne. He said, hey, I see this job's available. What happened? And I said, well, I quit. And he says, well, what do you think? And I told him how much it would suck and it was terrible and he shouldn't go for it. So <laughs> he took it um, and uh, lasted there for, for eight years and did a great job as uh, director of uh, planning for the city of Port Moody. And now for the past 13 years, and counting. He's been the general manager of uh, planning and development for the city of Coquitlam. So, Jim, welcome. Yeah. Okay, um, good evening and uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to tonight's uh, PIBC 60-year uh, celebration. It's, um, it's truly an honor to share, to share the stage uh, with such an accomplished and esteemed panel of speakers. Um, we have former and current elected officials, um, First Nation leader, uh, city administrators, former and, and current, as, long as, uh, as well as a room full of planners, so that's great. Um, I am humble but pleased to provide my perspective <clears throat> on urban planning, which will focus on the Tri-Cities area of the Lower Mainland, and specifically the cities of Port Moody and Coquitlam, where I've had the good fortune to reside, raise a family, and work in the planning field for almost 25 years. I have to admit that while growing up in Vancouver, I didn't have much knowledge or familiarity with uh, the Tri-Cities area. Uh, certainly there would be glimpses of Coquitlam where you just drove, drove along the old Trans-Canada Highway to the Port Madden Bridge, and you would notice uh, aging industrial areas. There used to be a lovely landfill site with uh, flaring vents, um, pipes there, and there was a lot of strip highway commercial development. Maybe it was a product of that zoning map. Um, <clears throat> alternatively, driving along Hastings uh, to the Barnett Highway, entering into Port Moody, left powerful images of mountains descending into the inlet. But large oil refineries, piles of sulfur being loaded under freighters, sawmills, and again, more strip commercial. At that time, carrying further to east on the Barnett to the Low Heat Highway brought you to the middle of Coquitlam and the oddity of a new shopping mall set in the woods bordered by mobile home parks. And I, I do remember these, uh, these glimpses as, a, as a, a teenager at the time. After graduating from uh, UBC Planning School in 1985, I was fortunate to start my career as a planning consultant with urban systems working through the BC interior. As uh, Eric mentioned, that was followed by uh, a period of time as the subdivision approving officer and current planning manager at the city of Kelowna uh, in the early 1990s. After 
After 10 years in the BC interior, I was to become re reacquainted with the Tri-Cities, and that's courtesy of my good friend and valued colleague, Eric Vance. And Eric's told you the story, but the, the real story is, the formal story is that the city of Kelowna and the UDI had organized a joint tour of several communities in the Lower Mainland, and one of them being uh, Port Moody. Eric hosted that, uh, that segment of the tour. And again, I couldn't help but noticing, sure, the refineries were still there, so was the sawmill. But there was something else uh, too, and this was a, an ambitious uh, new vision for a town center um, in, in the new town area. Which in time became the very successful Newport Village development by, the, uh, by Nat Boza. Um, Within a year, I had joined Port Moody as Director of Planning and Development, and in retrospect, moving from the city of Kelowna was akin to going from the pan to the fire. Working with a new city manager at Port Moody, rebuilding the Planning and Development Department from scratch, uh, experiencing a complete change on council, and surviving interdepartmental machinations that made me appreciate reading Machiavelli's The Prince at UBC. Through all that, though, we uh, accomplished uh, much in helping plan and guide development in Port Moody through those crucial transition years. Um, with the decline in the smokestack industry and the rise of new residential development, we were, um, as young planners, we were front row center to planning for the new Port Moody and at the same time processing major applications that were dramatically changing the face of that community. We were also kept busy with master plan projects and greenfield development in Port Moody's North Shore, as well as with smaller scale infill multifamily and several innovative heritage renewal projects uh, in the older part of town. And, and now, and in, in, uh, looking back, that's uh, some years ago, um, I, I do remember, and it would be remiss, remiss not to mention and acknowledge the great staff and planners I had the privilege to work with during my 10 years in Port Moody. Some are here tonight. Um, that would be wonderful professionals like uh, Tim Savoy, who's now the city manager in Port Moody, a real sucker for punishment. Um, Mark McMullen, uh, Ray Nosti, I believe Ray's here, uh, Pinder Bassi, and of course Eric Vance. After a tumultuous but freshly rewarding 10 years with Port Moody, a tremendous opportunity came up just to the east along Guilford Drive at the city of uh, Coquitlam. In early 2005, I started as the general manager of planning and development at Coquitlam, uh, a, position, a position I'm very happy to have fulfilled to today. The, um, the timing for this move to uh, to Coquitlam was opportunity, or opportune because planning activity and development was subsiding in Port Moody. As I used to say, the party was over. Um, Coquitlam, of course, is a, a much larger municipality with a series of different geographically distinct areas. Um, as well, the, the Coquitlam planning structure and system I found when I joined the city in 2005 was well set out and based on this logical pattern of readily identifiable geographic areas. The other uh, prominent planning element that has driven and focused decades of good planning work in Coquitlam is the promotion of preparing for and capitalizing on the extension of the rapid rail transit to the northeast sector. And we've heard that talked about at the regional level. So at the other end, at the municipal scale, uh, certainly I think Coquitlam was preparing for this for many, many years. Um, and so that train, the Evergreen SkyTrain line, uh, arrived roughly 40 years late, but was finally open for service almost two years ago in December 2016, and has been a real game changer for the Tri-Cities. Um, achieving that at the local level has been, a, I, I would credit, as a huge success to successive uh, Coquitlam mayors, councils, and staff. Um, on that point, too, I'd like to acknowledge and credit my uh, senior um, planning predecessors at Coquitlam. Um, as my boss, city manager Pete Steblin says, uh, he notes, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants that came before us to reach new heights in our time.
those uh, Coquitlam planters that uh, came before me uh, successfully established a very solid foundation for guiding this rapidly growing and evolving community and should be recognized. That's people like uh, the late Don Buchanan, uh, Deb Day, um, the late Eric Thiessen, Jane Pickering, who's here tonight as well, Emily Chu and many others. <clears throat> Since that time, the Coquitlam Planning and Development Department has productively carried on from that sound planning basis and have successfully prepared after extensive public consultation and city council involvement and has seen adopted a number of area plan updates and a steady stream of neighborhood plans. Collectively, these plans and uh, other overarching policies, development permit and design guidelines constitute Coquitlam's admittedly voluminous official community plan. Well, at the same time, um, staff, department of staff, which also includes our city building permits division, have been cranking out approvals for approximately 1,000 to over 1,500 new housing units per year. I would just like to um, briefly highlight, and I am particularly proud of, of a series of well thought out, practical and effective planning policy pieces we've crafted at Coquitlam in recent years. Um, one, our, our clear, well accepted and lucrative density bonus and community amenity contribution systems. Secondly, our leading edge and well received housing affordability strategy which has been very successful in helping create a range of affordable and rental housing in Coquitlam. We've also uh, produced high level strategic visions for key areas in advance of more neat, detailed neighborhood planning and we've come up with balanced, reasonable, workable policy procedures and regulations for dealing with hot button political items that often come before our city council, um, such as wireless communication facilities, liquor licensing, third party billboard signage, and most recently a new regulatory approach for recreational cannabis. Um, well, it's been extremely busy at the City of Coquitlam. I have been incredibly fortunate to see our department uh, strongly supported by successive mayors and councils, other staff, and for the most part, the broader community. Any regrets? Um, a few come to mind, uh, such as the, the regional growth strategy set to with Metro Vancouver's uh, not too many years ago. But that's a story for another day. So uh, thank you for listening. And again, congratulations on the 60th anniversary. So, Lisa, uh, what I've got written here is... Uh, nice. I, no. Uh, former Director of Development Services and Director of Strategic Services with New Westminster and currently the Chief Administrative uh, Officer at the uh, City of New Westminster. But there's so much more. Oh, really? oh there is. No, look, one story. Uh, we both got our start back in the 1980s as young consultants with Coopers and Lybrand Chartered Accountants and went off to do different things. But I guess off and on, we've been working together for over 30 years. Yeah, scary and depressing. Okay, thanks, Lisa. <laughs> First, show me what to do. That button. That button that there? Button and that button only. Uh, that, uh, that one there? Yeah, yeah. All that know me know that I have a pathological fear for technology. Okay. Um, first of all, I'm choked with Eric because I actually wanted to see a photograph of myself 30 years ago. <laughs> but you're only going to get me. Did I do this right? Not yet. Oh, see? I, I, did I get it? Okay, awesome. So. Um, I'm going to focus on downtown New Westminster as opposed to all of New Westminster in talking about, incidentally, our struggles. Um, I could actually pick up my speech right after uh, the euphoria of Expo. And so in that, I actually want to acknowledge all the planners I've worked with, with the city of New Westminster. Hands up, all of you that have worked, continue to work, feel like you will never leave work exactly because this is a journey and a discussion about it being a slog so you've heard lots of stories tonight about how it was easy uh, fabulous great great you know triumph well it was really really difficult in US Minster so how did we go from this to this it takes a village. I'm going to quickly talk about sort of the three phases of, of the work 
we did, when I say we, I mean it in a very collective sense. City councils, city staff, community, business community, everyone working together, sometimes at cross purposes, but collaborating. The first one, what we call from 86 to 95, the big dreams, Lots happening, right? We've got Expo Line, two SkyTrain stations in historic downtown U.S. Minster. Now, New Westminster is the oldest incorporated city west of the Great Lakes. Repeat it after me. <laughs> We're very small, 15 square kilometers. Very dense, very urban, very historic. Everything in U.S. Minster is redevelopment and infill. Nothing is easy. Adding two Skys train stations in an historic downtown is quite complex. And quite frankly, I think naive on most of our parts to assume that one can add infrastructure to that extent in a very established historic area without there being externalities. So big dreams and many realized a lot of provincial investment at that time. Douglas College downtown, Law Courts downtown, major BCDC development, sort of their whole industrial area. Province went in, actually granted us some new authority as well, so that at the time they created the New Westminster Redevelopment Act, designed to give the planner some independent authority because the province didn't want to deal with the pesky city council during the planning process. And the key. So, a lot of things happening. But this has also happened. So, New Westminster being a historic city, we've always had a, a well established, in many respects, sort of inner city challenges. Um, high concentration of liquor seats over the years, sort of the old beer taverns as well. God, that two minutes comes up really fast. <laughs> but this is what was dealing with. And so, Columbia Street, in fact, became a beacon for the type of challenges that we were actually starting to face. And when we thought that was difficult, it became more difficult between 1996 and 2005, and really some core downtown livability challenges. Drugs, the introduction of crack cocaine, downtown Westminster, downtown east side, parts of Surrey, following the SkyTrain line. And so some of you may not know this, but there was a time when we would look at new stations and cities were saying no, because it was seen as the drug line. Now, think about that today. Seems absolutely ridiculous to talk about that. But back then, there was this correlation between street level drug activity and what really people felt was happening sort of around some of the transit stations. Homelessness in levels we'd never seen before, a derelict waterfront. Oops, hang on, let me go back. But from 2006 onward, we actually started treating the downtown like a neighborhood. And that was the difference. And it started with a strategic partnership with BC Housing, where we started really dealing with some of the core issues that was facing our community. These are some um, housing projects, the homelessness project, the emergency shelter, um, and another homelessness project as well. And really actually started changing the composition. We actually started working more effectively with government as well. And also really progressive policies like the family friendly policy, the first one in the province. I can thank my colleague Beverly Green for that, for thinking visionary that she is, but really started looking at how are we going to get families in our community? Because um, we were finding quite frankly, just because of the urban nature of our work, families were leaving. And then also, you know, the, the the, those wonderful developments around transit-oriented when you actually do effective integration between transit and housing and then you incorporate your rental housing strategies around that, wonderful things happen. Oh, I'm finished. Put that thing away. <laughs> <laughs> to where we are today, where all the work now is around sort of a reimagined downtown, a reimagined waterfront. 
so we, we talked about, you know, things, crazy things that we would do in the past, like put, you know, purposely put freeways down the middle of, of a city. Well, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we thought it was really copacetic to put a parkade next to our waterfront. So a few years ago, we actually demolished half of it. Yay for people. Exactly. And that's what we have today. That's the Front Street Muse. This is the part that's been under a parkade since the 1950s. Wonderful when you have sunlight. Right? We also started doing more strategic investments, civic investments like the Animal Center, looking at arts, culture as well. It's a way of actually creating and, and creating a more robust downtown economy. And lastly, wonderful investments like that derelict site that I showed you, well, five minutes ago, is now the Westminster Pier site. Um, but, you know, $26 million to do this. And we're a small city, major investment. But at some point, when you invest in your community, you allow families a place, you look at free programs and opportunities, you know, again, it takes a village, it makes a difference. Thank you. So, our final speaker of this evening is uh, Jane Pickering, uh, currently the Senior Manager of Development Services at TransLink, uh, former Acting uh, General Manager of Planning and Development Services and Deputy Director of Planning at the City of Vancouver, uh, former Director of uh, Planning at Maple Ridge, and also a uh, longtime resident of Port Moody, uh, where I was for 30 years, and also with the city of uh, Coquitlam. So, been a lot of places. So, welcome very much, uh, Jane. No. Okay. Thanks very much. I was feeling, um, as the evening wore on, I was feeling a little guilty about not having used, uh, brought any slides, but having seen the difficulty everybody had with that deadly little clicker, I think I'm the smart one here tonight. So I'm here to provide a little bit of a different perspective on, um, on the evening. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, some personal experiences that I had through the, um, the adoption of the regional growth strategy. It's always been very interesting to me how uh, people report out on these things. The regional growth strategy got adopted, a big OCP got adopted as if it all just kind of happened and it landed and everybody loved it one night and that was it. That was, that was how it all happened. And for the regional growth strategy that was really not how it all happened. I can recall going to the tables with the regional planning directors. Uh, Jim and I were just talking, if it was seven or eight years, we went sometimes on a weekly basis um, to get to the point where we actually had a document that could um, be placed before all of the councils. You have to remember that 21 municipalities all had to agree at the same time, within a very short period of time, that this was the plan. And believe me, that took a lot of wrangling. There were lots of planning directors and planners who came in and out of the table. There were lots of councils that got re-elected and, and some got politicians that got kicked out that were supportive and not supportive. We had big events that happened across the region like the Olympics where the whole city of Vancouver staff had to go and work at the Olympics and so we couldn't bring the plan to because there was nobody at the city of Vancouver. So there were all of these things that had to happen and the, the one constant through it all were, were some of the regional staff. Uh, you may recall Johnny Carline who was the, the chief um, Chief Officer at Metro Vancouver and Christina DeMarco who was the planner who was trying to shepherd this all through. So 21 municipalities all had to agree and once we had um, gotten to the point where we had a plan that we could present, there, it was a very short period of time that it had to all be approved in uh, at, by the legislation. So. We all sat down, everybody looked at what their council meetings were, everybody tried to figure out what was, uh, when they could bring the plan forward. At the time I was the director of planning in the district of Maple Ridge and my council meeting was the last one in the region. So, <laughs> I watched over the course of a couple of weeks or maybe it was a couple of months watching all of these, plan all the plans go to all of those councils and they they were approving, they were approving, they were approving. Okay, we were okay. Some were balking a little bit, but you know, there was had to be some negotiation, but it was all going down in the region the way it should have. Came down to the last day. I think there was another council in the region met earlier in the day and Maple Ridge was the last one. And I was getting phone calls from the region. You know, it's gonna go down tonight, are you gonna be all right? And I'm like, 
oh yeah, it's going to be great. <laughs> and what I didn't tell them was my council was not solid on the regional growth strategy. I had had to defend the regional growth strategy for, I don't know, years. Uh, Clive mentioned the ritual flogging of the bureaucrats. Well, that was every second Tuesday night in Maple Ridge. And I was up defending the, the region and the, and the growth strategy. So it comes down to our council meeting, and I go down, I'm just shaking, I'm thinking, wow, well, you know, what if this doesn't happen? And uh, the council meeting goes on, and eventually we get to the decision about the regional growth strategy, and so the mayor calls the item, and we start going around the table, and they're asking questions, and I'm answering questions, and, you know, the, the, it went on for over an hour and a half, the debate, and I remember at one point sitting in my seat, and I was sort of looking down at my hands. I just couldn't look at them any longer. And I thought to myself, dear God, don't let it be me that doesn't get the regional growth strategy through. <laughs> so eventually, after an hour and a half, the, uh, the debate ends. He calls the vote. The mayor calls the vote. Four to three in favor. I'm like, oh. Thank God. But that wasn't the end of it. The council meeting wasn't over. Now, I had called the region, luckily, I had called the region earlier in the day and, and asked, you know, like, I'll send in the results the next morning. And they said, no, 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 you, it's got to, midnight is the cutoff. They had had a legal opinion. And if, and if, if it wasn't in by midnight, it was dead. Like, I had killed the regional growth strategy. Okay, so we got to go to midnight. So. Of course, if for some reason, this meeting went on and on, you know, the politicians who were in a talking mood, the meeting did not end till after 10.30 at night. And I leapt up out of my chair when the mayor called the, the end. I grabbed the city clerk, we ran upstairs. Of course, we couldn't just send it digitally. The region wouldn't accept digital. They had only had paper. So we had to get the mayor to sign it. We got the, we got the city clerk to sign it. And I stood at the fax machine with the city clerk watching that piece of paper go in. So it went in. But of course, there's nobody in the region to say if they got it. So I thought, oh my god, OK. So I went home. I got up really early. I was actually at work on time the next morning, which I rarely am. And uh, phoned Chris Marco right off the get-go, did you get it? And she says, yeah, we got it. So the regional growth strategy, at least for my small part of it, was safe. Um, of course, it did have to go through a couple of other uh, iterations. And I remember the day that uh, it went down to the Metro Vancouver board. We had a regional planning director meeting. And we had somebody watching when they were going to that item. And we all went down and stood in the, in the um, boardroom at Metro Vancouver where you know, all the politicians were talking. And they were, said their piece. And then they voted and passed it. And all the planning directors burst out in applause, kind of startled the board members. They're like, oh my god, who is up there. And that was the end of the regional growth strategy. It was a really long process. It took a lot of commitment on the part of many, many planners across this region and engineers across this region. And in the end, um, produced a document that I hope people have been proud of. I know that not everybody loves everything in it. I didn't love everything in it. But it was a great collaboration and a great compromise for the region. And hopefully, uh, it did as good a job as the original liv li uh, livable region strategic plan. So thank you very much, and uh, I'll give it back to Eric. Thank you. thank you, Era. Three speakers. Wow, what an evening! Oh my gosh, thank you. A huge thank you to all of the speakers. That was inspiring. Uh, as someone who's relatively new to planning in Vancouver, I feel like I learned a lot and I'll need to keep reflecting on this over the days and weeks to come. Um, but thank you so much to everyone. Uh, I think one of the things that really stood out to me uh, was just the incredible camaraderie that has helped get us to where we are today. The passion uh, and the, the hard work to overcome some seemingly insurmountable challenges, um, working together with uh, fellow planners and the teams that support you uh, to, to uh, help grow our region. So thank uh, yeah, I really agree. I really see the persistence, how persistence pays off working with your team members um, and also getting collaboration, a lot of collaboration, working together. Um, political will doesn't hurt. 
right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, um, we are at the end of our evening tonight, uh, but we did want to just thank uh, some people who made this event possible. Uh, so the organizers who put in quite a bit of time and passion, their own passion, to uh, making this possible. Uh, so we have uh, Alex and uh, Karen, Chi and Ada. And Robin. <laughs> and we have volunteers, Amanda and Emily, and um, we have Dan as well as April. So thank you to them. And of course, to our ERA leads, Ken and Michael and Eric, uh, thank you so much for not only coordinating and bringing all these people together, but also helping to weave these stories together throughout the evening. Uh, thank you to Ken for your donation of the gifts for our speakers. And uh, thank you to sponsors of the evening. Uh, so of course, PIBC, who um, funded the evening and made this all possible, as well as um, uh, we have the SFU City Program, as well as LoungeWorks, and uh, Andrea Stewart, who was the SFU, who is the SFU event manager, who helped coordinate everything. Mm. So our next event, we hope to see everyone at the South Coast Chapter's Winter Social. It'll be on December 6th. Uh, Toby's and Commercial Drive. Watch, um, look out for your newsletter. So we will see you then. Um, and I guess this concludes the evening. Um, get home safe and have a great night. Thank you. Thank you.